Right, so um, they've now given me uh, the uh, reaction to make sulfur trioxide, and it wants me to explain the conditions of temperature and pressure that could be used to obtain the maximum yield, and then look at a compromise between yield and reaction rates. So um, this question is an absolute gift. So uh, let's go through this. First of all, let's deal with temperature. It is an exothermic reaction, and therefore, if you increase the temperature, the reaction will go in the reverse direction. So to optimise yield for temperature, you would lose a low temperature because then that would push the reaction in the exothermic direction. Remember, that direction is exothermic, or the reaction is exothermic. So low temperature, reaction goes in the exothermic direction. How about pressure? Well, I've got three moles of gas on that side and only two moles of gas on that side. So I want to use a high pressure because by using a high pressure, the reaction is again driven from the left to the right. Um, so uh, from the side of the higher mole, uh, number of moles to the lower number of moles. So in summary, to maintain the highest yield, low temperature, high pressure. How about rate? Well, rate, high pressure is great because high pressure means you have the particles in a smaller volume, so more collisions per second. Um, however, high pressure, you obviously have to think about um, the cost of maintaining a high pressure and also it's dangerous as well. Temperature, you don't want to use a low temperature for rate and therefore you must have a compromised temperature. If you have a low temperature for rate, therefore the molecules have less energy less have the required activation energy and therefore there are fewer successful collisions so the rate is much lower. Okay so for the next one I haven't actually plotted the graph but it should look something like this. Um, make sure you get yourself a decent scale, you label your axes um, with time in seconds on the horizontal axis and concentration of SO3 in moles per decimeter cubed. Um, then it wants me to determine the initial rate. What you do is, this is the initial rate here, so you get yourself a ruler and you draw a tangent at time equals zero, like so, obviously you're going to use a ruler, um, and then you uh, determine the gradient of that line, which, if that's y, that's x, the gradient is y divided by x, like so. Okay, it then wants me to draw on the graph um, what would happen if I added a catalyst. If I added a catalyst, the reaction would be faster, but it would end at the same concentration here. So I've gone a little bit wrong there. So, which I'm sure you can see, I've gone too high there. So let's just draw that one again. It can't, oh, skews a little. Go like so, so it goes faster, but I get the same final concentration of SO3 at the end. Uh, just uh, for the tangent, when you draw that, you should get a value of 9.2 times 10 to the minus 4, but they will accept anything between 8 times 10 to the minus 4 and 1 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, they then ask me about catalysts now. Explain with reason why whether vanadium 5 oxide is homogeneous or heterogeneous it is of course heterogeneous because um, this is a solid catalyst whereas the reactants and products are gases so it's in a different state the catalyst is in a different state to the reactants and therefore it is heterogeneous the use of catalysts in industrial processes can be beneficial to the environment what is one reason for that um, well, uh, it's because they lower the energy required for the reaction, so there's lower energy demand. Um, they also provide um, an alternative route, which may require less toxic chemicals being used. Um, and uh, lower energy means that we don't combust so uh, such a high uh, number, such a high amount of fossil fuels to heat the reactants up. Okay, so they want me to now draw a Boltzmann distribution, which I've done, remember to label your axis. Explain why adding a catalyst increases the rate of reaction. Well, a catalyst provides an alternative route, 
we have a lower activation energy. So if you like, you can label this on the diagram. So if that's EA, this is EA with a catalyst, like so. So this is the additional number of molecules that can react. Whoops. Oh, let's just sort my um, additional molecules that can react. they have the activation energy has been lowered um okay so i think that's it right so i've now got three alcohols the key uh, and i've got to identify uh which ones they are key thing to note this one is primary this one is secondary and this one is tertiary so how do you go about it well i would reflux all three with uh K2Cr2O7 um, in acidic conditions. Um, the primary alcohol will be fully oxidized, so you'd use two square bracket O's to give you a carboxylic acid. Uh, one, two, three, four, plus water. And therefore, in the infrared spectrometer, uh, the infrared spectrum, when I ran this, I would see C double bond O, and I'd also see a very broad OH uh, band due to a carboxylic acid OH group. For my secondary alcohol, that would obviously be oxidized to a ketone. So I would only be adding one square bracket O to give me a CH3, CH2, CO, CH3, plus water again. So in the infrared spectrum of this one, I would see a strong C double bond O band, but no OH band at all. And for the final one, this would not be oxidized. So first of all, I wouldn't see a color change from orange to green when I oxidize it. However, secondly, if I ran the IR of that one, I, I would see an OH for an alcohol group, but I would not see an OH, uh, sorry, a C double bond O band. So I would only see OH for an alcohol. I would not see C double bond O. And by that way, I can identify all three by infrared spectroscopy.